All right, so this is abso403 or something like that. It's a fourth year class or something like that. But anyway, the point is that this is not oriented towards beginners. And I will be assuming some terminology and some uh, basic, I, I shall say, basic concepts. So absolutism. I'd like to talk about four things about it and really talk about cool things about it, I suppose. And the four things here are state transition, which encompasses, let's say, around mid 1500s to 1610. So that's when you start consolidating crown land and uh, revoking estate privileges. And then there is 1610, which is when Age of Absolutism starts. Well, not necessarily if global trade is delayed, but you get the point. And then there is court and country, the famous disaster that people like to fire intentionally. And finally, a sort of talk in theory on what your max absolutism really should be. Okay. So I will begin with the estate transition section. So first of all, there's like a normal way to do it. And I also want to share this 0 to 70 hack, as I call it. So let's just talk about the normal way to transition your estates. I would say 1550 is like a good starting point for when you want to start revoking estate privileges and consolidating. Uh, then you might want to, really the idea is you revoke estate privileges. And you generally do the following. You want to revoke ones that have high influence. So privileges that grant high influence. And um, I, I suppose, actually, what really matters is the difference between the influence gain of the privilege and the loyalty equilibrium. OK, so here's my point. There's a typical estate privilege that just gives 10% influence and 10% loyalty. So this has a difference of zero. So it's not that important to revoke it compared to say an estate that grants 20 influence and let's say 5% equilibrium, right? So these you wanna revoke, you wanna revoke those. Then you want to go down to the ones with lower differential, okay? And to get uh, loyalty, you might have to rely on selling crown land. You could. You could just rely on events. So you just wait on a good event that raises a particular state's loyalty, and then boom, revoke. Um, you can add privileges that raise, that has a high, or that has a very low, aka negative, influence minus loyalty equilibrium. A classic example would be monopolies. Monopolies give zero influence and give 10% loyalty equilibrium. So that can help you revoke other privileges, and then you can revoke the monopolies at the very end or something like that. Okay. And then um, the other key detail with loyalty slash lowering their influence is you might want to cut back on calling diets. Because diets give every estate 5% influence for 20 years, and they stack with the prior diets as well. So got to be careful, okay? But the point is the normal way involves just doing this and then seizing land at opportune times. And ideally, you want to hit 75 crown land um, with minimal estate privileges. This really depends on your setup, because what you essentially want is you have you want some amount of max absolutism, which I will probably talk about in corn country. Okay, but this is sort of the goal, I suppose, that you you want to aim for. And so here's another hack. So 
I want to talk about this 0 to 70 trick that I recently came up with. I don't know if I'm the first person to come up with it, though. Um, but I'm probably the first person to talk about it. Uh, probably not. I'm, I'm, I'm probably the first person to talk about it on my YouTube channel. So that must count for some sort of Guinness World Record. So here's how it works. This is best done with a live demo, but let me just quickly go through the rough roadmap. Okay, so here, here's your estate setup. Um, you might have the clergy, the burgers, and nobility. Nobility might hold like 40 land. Burgers, let's say, I don't know, 10, 10. Okay, so what does that mean? 20, 60. That means you own 40. Okay, I don't like that number. Let's change these to like 20, 20, 50. Okay, so now you, the crown land, is 10%. Okay, and it, it, maybe it's like 50, 95, and you're panicking because you don't know what to do. Well, here's here's what you can do. Um, it's It's quite clever, I think. So... You get your crown land below 11, and then you trigger estate statutory rights. I believe I have a little thingy. Oh, I don't. Oh, I'll show the event later. Okay, so you trigger ESR. Okay, what that does is that gives you 30 crown land, right? So it gives you 30 uh, crown land, so your crown land will be 40. Um, I don't know what these crown lands will be, but it'll be quite low, right? Let's say it's like, uh, oh, I don't know, 15, 15, 30. I don't know, I'm just making up numbers. Okay, and your nobility gets an estate privilege that makes uh, the minimum autonomy on your states 25. That is pretty bad if you're big, but, but you enact parliament that gets rid of the nobility. So the whole estate statutory privilege just goes away and you also get to take all of your nobility's crown land. So now you're at 70, you're at 70 crown land now. We went from 10, you took ESR, got to 40. And then you stole all of Nobility's crown land and got 70. How great is that? Okay, so let me do a live demo of this. All right, here I am as Castile. Doesn't really matter who I am. So this is like roughly the situation I pointed out. Now you can trigger estate statutory rights. Well, it's a meantime to happen event, so you have to sit on 10% crown land for a bit. And you get this event. Um, I suppose. Well, we'll see. So I'll click on this. Okay. So now my country is going to be 25% autonomy, which kind of sucks. And I will be enacting parliament so that's tier five this thing now you got to be conscious of the requirements to enact parliament first of all you see how it says land owned by the crown at least 33 percent well that just says my crown land has to be bigger than the amount of land the nobility owns right and the second point says that the nobility loyalty is equal or higher than their influence. That's this. Keep in mind that when you enact estate statutory rights, they get 10% loyalty. So just keep that in mind, okay? Anyway, so you pass parliament and... <laughs> Excuse me. And after a month tick, the nobility estate will go away. Now, since I know they're going away, might as well abuse them by taking monopolies. Note that on 1.32, two these monopolies will bug out and you will never be able to revoke them if your nobility goes away but on 1.33.3 which is the latest version this is fine you can do this um the nobility state goes away and you'll get production income again 
on your, you know, on whatever provinces that you gave the monopolies for. Okay, so I'm going to let a month tick pass. And, ah, I lied. Looks like you can also trigger an estate update without a month tick. Well, that's my bad. But there you go. So I get to keep Nobility's crown land. And you'll see that after a month tick, or maybe even below. Let's see? Okay. All right, let's try another month tick. There we go. I don't know why it took two month ticks, but there we go. As you can see, the autonomy went back to zero. ESR properly went away. So that's the zero to 70 hack. And I guess I'll go back to the presentation now. Okay, so let me just summarize what happened, right? We, we intentionally stayed at low crown land to trigger the estate statutory rights event. Okay, and after clicking, um, after clicking on it and accepting the uh, bailout, we get a lot of crown land, but our nobility gets a very crappy privilege. By the way, this assumes that we're a monarchy. Um, you can't really do this as burgers, theocracy, or like uh, people who you, uh, I think like Indian tech Hindus or something, because nobility won't get the statutory rights and parliament only resets nobility. So we did that. We gave nobility a crappy privilege and then we enacted parliament to get rid of the nobility. So the trap here is that you might put yourself in a situation where you cannot enact the parliament. Let's remind ourselves, to enact the parliament, we need to have higher crown land than nobility's land share. Okay. We also need to have higher nobility... Actually, I'll just write loyalty. This refers to nobility loyalty than the nobility influence. Right? And you gotta keep in mind that the estate statutory rights adds 10% influence. It removes a bit of influence though because you take away their land share, right? So it all balances out. But th one of the benefits to the strategy is that you don't have to go from here to here instantly. Yes, you'll suffer from 25% autonomy and lowered econ, but if you know you need a couple more points of loyalty, great, just give nobility um, a monopoly or whatever to raise their loyalty and you can satisfy this. Maybe you need a bit more crown land. Well, maybe you just dev push a bit, right? Just dev push a bit or something like that. So that's, that's it for the estate hack. And I guess now I'll talk about how to raise autonomy. So you're 1610, um, age of absolutism started and of course, you have some amount of max absolutism, but your current absolutism, all right, I can't write, is zero. So the question is, how do you get from, how do you get this zero number to ideally your cap, so X, right? How do you do that? How do you raise your absolutism? So there are two ways to do it. Well, technically there's a third option, which is use ticking modifiers. But that's slow, I don't recommend it at all, but it's a thing. So first is through stacking certain modifiers, okay? So here I actually did prepare a screenshot, so let me take this little thing from the wiki, okay? And this shows you how you can get to absolutism, right? And the important thing is that there are a couple clicks that you can do to raise absolutism. First one is raising stability. Okay. The other is harsh treatment. So let me just give stability as an example. Suppose you have 90% stab cost reduction. Okay. What that means is it costs 10 admin to stab up. Oops. Okay, so that means if you want 100 absolutism, you pay 1,000 admin. It's it's a decent amount, but honestly, it's not that much. Like, it, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good deal, okay? 
and with monuments and stuff, it's not that hard to reach 90% stab cost nowadays. Um, the question is, how do you stab up? Because to stab up, your stability can't be 3. And it's hard to get 90% stab cost while at, while at 2 or 1 stab anyway. Well, one option is through native policies. Okay, so if you have a colonist, you have like three buttons where you can change your native policy. It's like your colonization policy. Uh, changing it has no cooldown and reduces your stability by one. Okay, so one idea is to be at, say, zero stab. Okay, you spend 10 admin to stab up. Okay, and then you change your native policy to whatever, it goes to zero, and then you pay another 10 admin to stab up, and so on. So each of these zero to one transitions will give you one absolutism. Okay? So that's one way. And of course, you don't have to get all your absolutism this way. This is just a way to supplement your absolutism gain. And then there is the harsh treatment. This one's kind of self-explanatory, but you just stack harsh treatment and then you harsh treat rebels. Harsh treatment can go all the way down to five mil points. So five mil points per absolutism isn't a bad deal at all. Um, or rather one absolutism per five mil points. Okay, but it's quite hard to stack this, right? So you can get it from age of absolutism's um, age bonus or age ability. That takes a while though. Um, there's like Hussite, certain national ideas like Chagatai, and for generic for nations with generic missions, uh, you should save your mission. I believe it's called like oh I don't remember. Is it like conquer new states? I forgot. But you get a mission that reduces harsh treatment cost by thirty three percent. Right. So this is thirty three. I think this is fifty. I don't know what these are, but anyway, the point is, in some cases, you can stack it, and that's another way. Okay, so next way, or next section, is to lower autonomy. Now, the part A, which was stacking modifiers, right, that you can get absolutism on the fly, right? You have 30 absolutism, you want to get a couple more, great, stab up. Lower your stab, stab up again, and so on. Uh, now, th these uh, lower autonomy tricks require preparation that involves lowering your absolutism at first, and then raising it by spamming lower autonomy. Okay, so what that means is you can't really use the strategy to boost your absolutism from, say, like 30 to something. It's mostly about boosting from zero to something, right? So. Once Age of Absolutism starts, you probably want to start with this strat, unless you have enough modifiers and modern points to just work off of A. If you can solely work off of A, then you're good. But if you need to do a mix of B and A, or maybe just B, then yeah, start with B, then do A, right? Okay, so the key idea with lowering autonomy is the fact that the following, if you decrease autonomy, you get absolutism. And it's as simple as that. So the question is, how do we decrease autonomy? Well, to decrease autonomy, we need provinces with high autonomy. I don't know the actual number. I don't think it's 25, even though it lowers by 25. Um, so yeah, so the question really is, how do we prepare provinces that we can lower autonomy for? The popular method is by accepting Particularist Rebels. Ever since 1.30, I don't recommend this. This is, frankly, an outdated strategy. It still works, but it's really annoying because you lose 10% crown land to the burgers. And getting 75 crown land is very important, right? So I don't recommend this, but it, it still works, okay? It, it still works. Another way is to increase autonomy um, before Age of Absolutism starts, and time it such that you can decrease autonomy right when Age of Absolutism begins. Okay, this works if you're prepared and you have fairly low monthly autonomy change. Okay, I don't recommend this either, but it's still a strategy, I suppose. 
Okay, another way is to time diplo annexations at to begin at the age of absolutism. I don't recommend this either. <laughs> I don't recommend most things. I don't recommend this either because you kind of want to wait to integrate your vassals till you have absolutism, right? So you don't pay as much dip points. So I don't. I just don't like the idea. It's I, I'm a bit greedy and I want to stack the modifiers first and then spend uh, fewer points, right? But yeah, to explain the whole subject thing, any province that you integrate from subjects will start at 60 autonomy, or if it has higher autonomy, it'll start that. So it's 60, and then you lower it. Okay, it's as simple as that. Um, the other strat is by using state unstate micro. Okay. This requires a lot of non folk wars. Or you can use folk wars too, but you'll lose the folk wars permanently. You'll have to re folk war them. It will become territorial cores because you're going to state and unstate stuff. Okay? This is the way I recommend. This is the way I do it nowadays. Um, although sometimes I get lazy and I aim for just A. But so let me do a demo of this, okay? All right, so I'm back to my trusty Castile. It's 1445, but I used console to make it Age of Absolutism. Okay, we have zero absolutism, whatever, some decent amount of max absolutism. And I integrated Mamluks and removed the full cores. Okay, so these are all territories. You can envision that whatever situation you're in, you know, you have a lot of territories that you haven't fully cored. And the point is, you can use these productively to gain absolutism. So really, the key idea lies in the fact that if you raise autonomy, okay, you can no longer raise nor lower autonomy for 30 years, right? That's the cooldown, unless you have this modifier. Autonomy change cooldown. But this is only for the case of raising autonomy. If you raise autonomy, okay, and then state the province, sorry, and then unstate the province, the cooldown to change autonomy just goes away. This was something they added in 1.30, I believe, because they didn't like people stating something, raising autonomy, and then unstating it. Um, so that was their attempt at fixing it. But the point is, you can now lower it to gain absolutism. But remember, raising autonomy decreases absolutism. But that's all right, right? Because we have zero absolutism. So you take all your territories, not all, I'll, I'll show up. I will talk about the formula later. But you take your territories, raise autonomy, state, unstate, and now you can lower them, right? That, that's the key idea. You can lower them to get absolutism later. By the way, on 1.33, there's a better way to do this. Note how when I did this, I gave it 100 autonomy, while on these, I gave it 75. Well, it's a bit weird, but you can uh, prevent this 100 autonomy shenanigans by... Um, State, unstating, and temporarily you get territories with 50% autonomy when you do that. So then you raise autonomy. It says it's 90, but it's actually 75. Okay, and then you state. You have to unstate now to update the autonomy again. And now it's 75, and so you can lower. So that's slightly better than this situation. But anyway, so the point is... You do this whole micro, right? You just raise autonomy. State, unstate to reset it. And now I can, I can lower here. I do the same thing here and so on. I keep doing it. All right, so let's go back to the theory. Okay, so we're back here in our trusty Blackboard. And one question is how much do you have to do it? Well, you can calculate it based on this. You get one autonomy per 20 development. So if you want to get X, you just want to do 20 times X development. 
okay? The best way, honestly, to do it is to just, like, eyeball it. You might end up um, undershooting, and in that case, you can rely on taking modifiers or stabbing or whatever. So, otherwise, you can also overshoot it, and in which case, you know, that, that's fine, too. So, now I want to talk about court and country. So, court and country... That's the famous disaster that people take, right? And the key, the reason why people take that disaster is for the final event. When you complete the disaster, if your absolutism is at least 65, you get 20 permanent max absolutism, right? Okay. So some some uh facts while you're in court and country your max absolutism goes down by 20 while you're in court and country but to end this disaster in the best scenario you need at least 65 absolutism so the the conventional way the conventional wisdom people give is you need 85 max absolutism before entering the disaster at the very least then you enter the disaster gets reduced by 20 so it's at 65 and then well you can do this and you'll leave the disaster with 105 right you get plus 20 by exiting the disaster and you get another 20 by this event okay let me tell you that conventional wisdom is not true not necessarily true. Why is that? Well, it turns out that reloading the game updates these event options. So if you end the disaster, say at 60 absolutism, right? Maybe maybe your max absolutism during the disaster was 60. You just didn't have enough. Okay, so you end the disaster, you're at 60. You don't see this event option. You see the other event option that gives 10 max 10 max absolutism, okay? But wait, you have four months. Uh, your max absolutism is now 80 because you exited disaster. And then you gotta somehow get this to 65. Then you save and reload the game and the event will show this option. Okay, so you get 20. So that's what I mean by the ending trick. Coring country ends, the event, this event will pop up for four months. So you have four months where you can raise your absolutism a bit higher if you need it, right? So that's why you don't necessarily need 85 max absolutism before entering this disaster. You can technically go by with, I suppose, 65, right? Even though it'll be kind of hard to go from 45 absolutism to 65 absolutism in four months. Because remember, your max abso will go up by 20 when you exit the disaster, but your absolutism won't. So you have to still raise it to enable this event option, okay? The other thing I want to talk about court and country is that if you look at the ending condition, it'll, it'll give you a whole list of things that need to be satisfied for the disaster to end. But one of the one thing is no rebel occupied provinces. That's like a condition, right? That's a that's a that's a um, condition needed for the disaster to end. The other the other key one is the 10 year mark. Okay. What I suggest is I suggest letting a rebel occupy an un no zone of control province during court and country and then just keep it occupied. Why? Because you can then unoccupy the province after any time after the 10 year mark to leave court and country at will. So you can better control when you can leave court and country just in case you got some bad events or whatever and you just didn't have the right amount of absolutism to get this event option, right? So you can control when to exit the disaster to some extent by keeping one rebel occupied province and then unseizing it when you're ready after this 10 year mark. Okay, so finally I want to talk about max absolutism. So you can look up the wiki for how to get how to raise max absolutism 
but I think I see a lot of people claim that you only need 100 max absolutism. In some sense, that has, there's, a, there's wisdom there because even if you have 200 max abso and you have 200 abso, you'll, uh, you'll only get 100 abso worth of benefits. So the only advantage this gives is that it gives you more leeway, right? You can, for example, raise autonomy, um, do other things to lower your absolutism without compromising your buffs from absolutism. And that's precisely why I recommend 105. Um, even though, sure, you have five extra absolutism that isn't giving you any meaningful direct buffs, by being at 105, if you're a typical monarchy, you can have your legitimacy fluctuate a bit. Maybe you take a couple of royal marriages and it goes to 104. No biggie. On the other hand, if you're 100, doing that might get you at 99, which, first of all, is kind of annoying, but um, could really hurt you if you uh, sort of plan out your overextension. Maybe your overextension is like 100.9. 100 the 101 mark gives you most of, most of the nasty events. Well, it gives you what? It gives you rebel sentiment, I think. Uh, the 100 mark, so being at 99.9, at .9, will keep you also immune from the pulse events. Or the other way around, sorry, I don't remember. But yeah, the point is, you might be like carefully controlling your overextension, and then your absolutism goes down a bit and it fluctuates, and you're a bit over, and you screwed yourself over. That could happen. Uh, the other thing is maybe you want, maybe there's this like random island in the middle of nowhere. It has like five unrest. It's 111 dev, and you just don't feel like sending boats there. It's too much effort. Well, you can raise autonomy, and again, your 105 absolutism might go to 104. No big deal, right? On the other hand, if you're 100, well, it's a, a bit of a deal. Maybe it's not a big deal, but it could be a big deal. So having that 105 gives you peace of mind to do stuff like lower, sorry, uh, raise autonomy, lower war exhaustion, uh, slightly lower your max absolutism, whether it be legitimacy, religious unity, and so on, right? So that's why I say 105 is a good max absolutism to have, and you should really plan around getting that. And yeah, just check out the wiki page, figure out all the sources of max absolutism, and just plan your privileges and so on so that you satisfy that mark so that is all i had hopefully hopefully you learned stuff you see i don't really play I, i'm fairly well known as someone who doesn't play till age of absolutism but you know i i've, I've had my fair share of absolutisms and i've done like enough theory crafting i suppose to uh somewhat pretend to be an authority on the matter. So I hope these are enlightening, eye-opening, or whatever. <laughs>